Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world. I'm Paul Elam, and I am broadcasting today from An Ear for Men. Um, we are a, a mental health channel for men, and how appropriate today that we would be discussing the subject of false allegations, and uh, I have the privilege of being here talking to somebody that I met at ICMI 16 in London just recently, as many of you know. Uh, Mark Pearson uh, was the victim of a false allegation, and one, there are some details about his case that we cannot go into, but there's quite a bit that we can, and it's honestly, well, you know, some false allegation cases end up in very, very bad case scenarios. There's been suicides over it. There's been men unjustly imprisoned over false allegations, and uh, those are the extreme end of the case. But one of the things that occurred to me as I was watching Mark Pearson deliver his talk, that talk, by the way, will be available on this channel uh, in the future. Um, was the amount of trauma that's involved with something like this happening to you. We tend to talk about false allegation cases as a matter of a miscarriage of justice, but we rarely get into the mental health issues behind what it's like to suddenly find the police at your door about something you know nothing about and then to enter a Kafkaesque nightmare of legal terrorism, uh, for lack of a better word, and there probably isn't a better word. Uh, but with that, um, I want to sort of keep that in mind as we go into this discussion. And um, with that, I would like to introduce Mr. Mark Pearson. Hi, Mark. Hi, Paul. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, why don't we just go ahead and get into the nuts and bolts of, of this and you know, most of the people in my audience are going to be familiar with your story, uh, but there is always will be people and people down the road that see this interview that aren't familiar with it. So can you just give us an overview from the beginning? What happened to you? Okay, so the first I knew was on the 5th of February, 2015. Six policemen turn up at my doorstep and ask to come in. And I, I ask, what, what's this about? And they say, can we just come in and we'll tell you when we come in. So I invited them in and the first thing they said was, we're arresting you for sexual assault. And my jaw just dropped because it was the last thing I was expecting. I thought it was, I, I, I didn't really know what it was about. I thought maybe it was some crime in the area or something. And they said, we are going to take you to a police station and interview you. A woman has claimed that you sexually assaulted her in Victoria, St in Waterloo Station. And you're going to be questioned. So they, they took me to a police station. Uh, they processed me to start with, took my DNA, my fingerprints, photographed me, put me in a cell. And I had to wait for a duty solicitor, because I didn't have a solicitor at the time, to... Uh, arrived so that I could be interviewed. So that was about two hours later, and I was interviewed for about an hour. And they basically just said, you sexually assaulted this woman, she's made this accusation, um, you, you put three fingers into her vagina as you walked past her in Waterloo Station on your way home from work. And I said, but you, I was, I, they told me that she said I was carrying a newspaper in my left hand. So I said, well, how am I supposed to have done that when I'm carrying a newspaper in the hand that I'm supposed to put into her vagina? They said, we don't know. And at this point, uh, now I understand that there was uh, CTV, that there was surveillance video. Uh, had the police seen that video at this point? Were yeah, you they saw that from the start. So they, they should have compared what she said with the CCTV imagery because anyone looking at that, and I suppose most people watching this have seen that online, you can see that it's not remotely what she says happening. Now, to give us sort of a feel for this, again, I can't imagine. I've, I've certainly had... Um, you know, I've had a, a probably a, a more than a few women in my life, uh, at least politically speaking, point the finger at me and say you weren't nice to me or something like that. But I, 
I can't imagine what it must be like to have six police at your door. Um, what, you must have felt like you had stumbled into an alternate universe or something. At this yeah, point. it's just cognitive dissonance. You, you can't comprehend what's happening. It's, I, I, it was like I was still asleep. I just had no idea what was going on. I was shaking all the way to the police station. It, the whole thing was just bizarre. And this was, was this late at night that they knocked on No, you? this was early in the morning. Oh, this was very early in the morning. They, they tend to do that. They arrive at your doorstep at about 6.30. Okay, hoping that I guess the surprise that element. In case you were going to try to sexually assault all six of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, when they came there, and I, I probably shouldn't be making light because this is, a, I mean, it's its an incredible situation. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I have seen the CCTV uh, footage of this. Uh, it is, and I will try to get a link in the low bar up to it because I know it's online uh, to this after we're done with this hangout. I probably should have done it in advance. But anyone watching this footage knows that there is no possible way that there could have been a sexual assault. I mean, it literally shows them, they, uh, or at least a blurry image of them, basically walking past each other without breaking stride, period. There was no hesitation, no stop. And of course, the charges allege that Mr. Pearson um, not only forced three fingers inside this woman's vagina, uh, but also struck her. Um, uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm just, I guess, Mark, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around the idea how the prosecution in this proceeded with a straight face, how the police proceeded with a straight face when they had the video that without any doubt exonerated you of any wrongdoing whatsoever. How did these people just manage to keep coming at you with this charge? Because if, if you would tell the viewers, how long did you go through this legal nightmare? How long did it last? Well, it was a year to the trial from, from when I was arrested. I mean, that they'd already put my image online in January of 2015. So I was actually a wanted person for a month without knowing it. And um, after they arrested me, I was put on bail and I had to keep renewing the bail once a month. And usually, I, just before the day I was supposed to go to back to the police station, they'd phone me and just say, your bail's renewed, don't bother coming in. And that happened until June. And I was going to go into bail, rebail again. And I got a phone call from my solicitor saying, when you go in tomorrow, you're going to be charged. Which was just a nightmare. That was the worst day. Just the fact that they'd looked at the CCTV, I hadn't seen the CCTV by that point. We didn't get the CCTV images until August. So all I'd seen was a very blurry image of me, uh, a, a very bad black and white photocopy that I was handed in the, in the police interview. And um, that's all I knew. I, I assumed that they were mistaking me for somebody else. And what made it more complicated for me was another guy attacked a woman in the same station, in the same sort of area, in the morning of that day. And he kind of resembled me. So I thought maybe they were confusing me with him. So no, until we actually- The other one, was this an attack that actually took place or was yeah, this- Yeah, he, he sexually assaulted a blind woman on, on another tube train. And okay. he was arrested and I think, I, I'm not sure if he was charged and convicted, I'm not sure about that. But they know that that wasn't me because that was brought up in court. So whether they assumed that was me, I'm not sure. Can you give us a feel, Mark, for what your emotional, mental state was like uh, from the time of the arrest up until the time you were told you were going to be charged? Uh, how did it affect your day-to-day -day living? Um, uh, what was your state of mind during this whole thing? Did you just assume that they were going to drop the charges, or were you getting very apprehensive? What was that like for you? Just the whole gamut of, of feelings. I, I had anxiety, depression, um, stress, nightmares, night sweats. Um, you don't know who to turn to. I mean, luckily, I had a mutual friend of Erin Pitsy, so I got in touch with her, and she was a rock for me because she, she just explained why this might be happening, 
that it was it could be political the fact that i was still going to be put on trial we were hoping that the, the charge might be dropped at the point where we actually got the cctv imagery analyzed by an expert and um my solicitor sent that to a court and the judge advised the cps to actually have another look at this case and perhaps drop it i mean he, he couldn't force them to do it and the CPS being the Crown Prosecution Service yeah, for, sorry. for Americans in the audience. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and again, it, it's this is this is like an alternate universe we're talking uh, about here. It's very hard to put this in terms of of what we would normally think of as a real world narrative because this is the the stuff that motion pictures are are made of only. You know, we find with these things that this is not terribly uncommon. And one of the things I want to bring into this and, and to get your thoughts on and to let everybody know, we cannot mention the name of the accuser in this discussion. Um, uh, unfortunately, the laws are such that uh, Mr. Pearson's name and image could be flooded in the media, which it was, and that, uh, of course, searches on his name on Google will return this uh story for the rest of his life but the accuser who absolutely by by looking at the cctv video has no credibility whatsoever uh in their story uh can't be mentioned but i also note that allison saunders the uh the crown prosecutor the, i guess she's the the what the chief prosecutor she's the dpp yeah the, the director of public prosecution so she's the head of the whole cps okay and didn't she come out, uh, I know that there was one case where there was somebody in her office that worked for her accused of something and they did not prosecute. And I think one of the political reactions she had to that was to come out and promise the public uh, a year ago or more that she would increase prosecutions of sexual assault by a third. Now, first, I don't know how you get to that kind of statement that, I mean, Generally, prosecutors are supposed to prosecute on crimes committed, uh, not set quotas for how much they're going to. I mean, if, if sexual assaults dropped, how would you increase prosecutions? Um, but she did make a political statement that it appears very much that, that she has followed through with, with specious prosecutions like this. Um, do you feel or can you even comment on the idea uh, that this was just simply politics and that you were caught up in the web of, of Alison Saunders trying to regain her reputation? I, I can't think what else it could be. The, the fact that they had all the evidence before them and they could see that nothing had happened. I can't see what other explanation there could be apart from it was political. Didn't the, the judge in this case um, at some point recommend to the prosecution that they not proceed? Yeah, this was a different judge. It wasn't the one in the trial. This was before the trial. So we, as I said, we had the, the, the footage analyzed by an expert and he concluded that it took about half a second for me to walk past the woman. And we, we used that and, and asked for the case to be dropped. But the CPS decided in their wisdom just to push it through and carry on. Gosh. I mean, I don't, I, I have to tend to agree with you. I can't figure out another explanation for why somebody would take an obviously innocent man um, and go ahead and push a prosecution on something for which not only did they have no evidence that a crime was committed, they had a ton of perfectly viable exculpatory evidence demonstrating that you had not committed the crime. Um, it also came out after uh, you were, and to let everybody know that uh, Mark was acquitted of this, naturally, uh, there was no evidence. But it also came out that the prosecution, and, and maybe you can verify if this is true, what I've heard is that the prosecution, in presenting the evidence of the video, actually slowed the video down intentionally uh, to make it look like that your being in her proximity was longer than it actually was in real life. Is that true? That's true. The, the, the CCTV imagery is a sequence of still images. So the camera in Waterloo Station takes a picture once every second. 
and they gave that to us as a DVD of the sequence. But my solicitor, I didn't notice at first, my solicitor noticed that the three still images where I walked past the, the actress had been slowed so that they took two seconds to change. So in effect, it, it made it look as though I had twice real time walking past her. And it was only for those images in the middle where I walked past her. The rest were just normal time. And I so, guess, was it the prosecution's contention that between still images that were two seconds apart that you committed the assault and then yeah. regained your composure to be back in the same exact position you were in two seconds ago? Yeah. They, they just tried to make it look as though I had longer to do what they said I'd done. Wow. And so we're going to go back now to the, the moment that your, your solicitor told you that you're going to come in and be charged. You, can you recall what was going on in your head at that moment as soon as you heard those words? I was on a, on a tube train at the time and I just got off and I just couldn't stop shaking. I just sat down and was trying to work out why I was being charged for something that I hadn't done. And, you know, I asked my solicitor that, what, what, how can they charge me for something I haven't done? So I just couldn't comprehend why it was happening. Did you get an answer? No, she just said, because they can. <laughs> I guess that was the most honest answer to give you. Yeah. I don't think she understood why. It must be hard for her in that position. Maybe. And so... Now, you said leading up to that point that you experienced increased anxiety, depression, uh, I'm sure mood swings, fear, um, a lot of concerns about your future. Did that intensify after you found out that they were going to proceed? Yeah, because I thought if I could be charged, I could very well be imprisoned. I mean, if I knew I was innocent, but if it could go that far... I mean, you hear of miscarriages of justice, so you, you assume that the worst could happen. I mean, it was, it was quite unlikely, but you're not thinking straight at that point, because you think if it's got this far, it could go all the way. Well, yeah, and some people might argue that uh, it would be very unlikely that you would find yourself charged in standing trial. Um, but indeed, that was certainly happening. Yeah, and it's true that people have been in prison for things they haven't done. You know, it happens all the time. Oh, yeah, and, you know, for viewers' benefit, if you do any research, like at the Innocence Project, which is a U.S.-based organization that looks into uh, people's cases that were uh, falsely convicted and imprisoned, the number one crime for which they get people released uh, with DNA exoneration is rape. Um, only in a case like Mr. Pearson's, since there wasn't even an alleged real exchange of DNA, uh, had he been convicted, that kind of exoneration would not have been possible to him. Um, I know we can't discuss the identity, but during this whole process, you know, this individual that, uh, of dealing through the courts and police with this individual that alleged you did this really despicable act. Did you develop any theories or ideas on what could have possibly motivated her to do something like that? Not at the time, but since, since, it's, uh, since the trial, I've, I've been approached by several people that worked with her and they weren't at all surprised that she did this. Oh, did they give you any insights into why they might have felt that way? Uh, I can't really go into too much detail, but they said it was in the nature of, uh, of her character that she, she would do something like this. That's all I can say, really. And to your knowledge, has this individual experienced any consequences whatsoever? From no, her? I mean, she might even benefit from this. She can, she can claim money for this, victim compensation. Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, as far as the CPS are concerned, she's still a victim. They just couldn't manage to prosecute me, so they they probably think I'm guilty. 
I mean, they've kind of made that clear when I went to see somebody at the CPS. We managed to get an appointment to see a guy called Greg McGill. We, we asked to see Alison Saunders, but obviously she wouldn't see us. So she passed it on to somebody beneath her. And we went to see him uh, July. And he just more or less said, he thought I'd, I'd possibly done it. He didn't say the CCTV didn't prove that I hadn't done it. He said it just didn't show an incident. Was your case, when it came to deliberation, was this ruled on by a single judge or was there a jury involved? Uh, it's a jury, yeah. Three, three men and um, nine women. And how long did it take them to acquit you? 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Uh, basically, enough time to uh, set together the rules of order for deliberations. And the like poor person, and it, it, the jury was actually on a new day because the trial overran on on the last day, so we had to have the verdict on the last day. But they deliberated for approximately ninety minutes. Wow! So what the jury was able to figure out, by all means uh, or by all measures, immediately, uh, because ninety minutes in a jury is no time at all. I mean, you go through a process where you assign role. Uh, somebody to form in the jury and you uh, discuss how you're going to approach the evidence and then you actually get to your deliberation. Uh, that takes time. So this was almost instantaneous acquittal and exoneration um, that 12 people off of the street could see plainly as could be. And yet you still have people in CPS that are talking to you and treating you as though they believe that you've committed the sexual assault. Wow. Yeah, it's just unbelievable that so their mindset is so set they, they just they can't see anything else and what can you maybe share with us a little bit about what it was like for you what sort of process you went through as they came back and read the verdict of not guilty I've said this before I just felt numb because I'd gone through all that hell that whole year of, of waiting to be put on trial and not knowing why. And I was, after the verdict, that I expected the, the judge to say something, but all he said was, you're free to leave. That was it. So nobody's ever issued an apology of any kind? Really? Nobody's given any explanation as to why it happened. Yeah, you would think, I mean, I guess for a lot of people, they might, or at least somebody like me that has not been through this experience, you know, I'd be sitting here thinking, wow, he must have been really jubilant when they read not guilty. But that's not the case. I mean, at this point, the trauma has been going on for, what, a year and a half? Yeah, I mean, the strain just gets to you after that, you know, a whole year. I mean, some people wait several years for the trial. It's, it just takes its toll. You can't celebrate because you're just drawn. And so how long has it been now since the not guilty verdict? How much time? No, it's about six months. Six months now. And how are you doing now, Mark? I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm trying to find a, a solicitor that will take on, on my case to try and prosecute either the police or, or the CPS or both, which is really difficult because they have to work with the CPS. So for them, it's kind of career suicide if they take on the CPS. The police would probably be easier to try and sue, but it's still hard to find somebody. So I'm, I'm in the process of, of meeting people at the moment. And so are you looking at an individual lawsuit that you want to pursue or perhaps class action? Because, you know, we know that you're not the only one out there that's been scooped up by CPS and the police and falsely accused. Yeah, I mean, I have to do it on my own to start with. But hopefully if, if I can get the ball rolling, then other people might join in. I mean, a class action would be perfect because the system needs to be changed. And I think that's the only way it's going to happen. If I take them on on my own, the chances are they might settle out of court 
and then the system won't change. They'll just try and fog me off. So what is what is the takeaway uh, from all this? I mean, it, you know, every story in life is supposed to have some sort of takeaway and some sort of moral lesson. Um, you know, sometimes we end up with guys saying, well, be careful of the character of woman that you go out with or the character of woman that you marry. But you were simply walking through a train platform. Uh, it wasn't like there was some kind of caution that you could exercise. Uh, I mean, other than, you know, lock yourself in your flat and never come out, uh, which, you know, uh, still may not uh, keep people out of trouble. But have has there been a lesson in any of this for you? I mean, that's the scary thing about my case, is it, it could happen to anybody. You don't, you don't even have to know a person for them to accuse you. So if that can happen to me, that can happen to any person in the country. Or rather, probably any man in the country. Do you, I mean, it does happen occasionally to women, but not very often. I think it's mostly men. Well, it, it has happened to women. We need to acknowledge that. But the, the vast preponderance of, of victims of false allegation are male. Uh, that's clear cut. Has this changed you as a person, do you think? I'm trying not to let it change me. But, I mean, it's changed in the sense that I've met some really wonderful people from this. I mean, Erin Pitsy was the first, and she, she led me to meet other people. So, if nothing else, I've met a, a vast range of really interesting people. Um, you spoke very well at the conference about this. Um, I'm wondering maybe if you can share with us a little bit about what it was like. I mean, because you, you've done some public speaking before, you're an artist and you talk about your artwork to groups of people, but certainly I'm, I'm guessing that you've never had the experience quite like you had at the Excel Center. Uh, no, it was very unusual for me. Um, I, yeah, I'm used to talking about my artwork, but to actually talk about your, your personal life in that respect. Um, it, I was nervous, but not too nervous. But um, the thing that happened was when I started to talk about being interviewed by the police, I kind of had a, a, a flashback and I was back in that situation. So I hesitated for a while and I had to kind of draw breath and just try and get through it. So I think people noticed that and people told me afterwards that they found that quite moving. but. I just felt a bit embarrassed about it, to be honest. Well, uh, I was there for your talk, of course, and I was uh, had the, the good fortune to be sitting on the front row, and I could definitely see it. I could see that there was, you know, post-traumatic stress, which is what I think this is, uh, is a visible um, manifestation. You can see the trauma as it registers on people's face. And I wondered, as you began speaking, if you were flashing back, if you were being sort of doing that out of body thing that is so common to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, going back and reliving this. And as it turns out, after asking you about it afterward, you certainly were. Um, I know this is personal, but I'm gonna ask anyway, because we, we have a lot of people in our audience that have maybe not been through your same exact circumstances, but similar things. Um, are you getting the support you need for, because uh, this is not something just because, as I'm sure you're aware, that just because the, the jury found you not guilty, it doesn't mean that the year and a half of insanity and hell they put you through just goes away. Um, yeah, I mean, that's very true. I, I had therapy when I was first arrested and um, uh, that was for six weeks that was cognitive behavioral therapy and that helped with the trial because it helped you to kind of settle yourself and breathe and just try and relax try and relax i mean you can't relax totally and then after the trial i had another session of, of therapy because i, I had a uh, i just had an anger about what happened and why why it happened and why i didn't get any sort of explanation so so i have had therapy um and the, the conference helped, talking about it helps. Although I, I start shaking when I talk about it, so there's obviously something still underlying there. But that'll go, I'm sure that'll go eventually. 
Yeah, um, because I think the, the at least the 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 big picture look at this that I can take out of it is that when you look at this situation honestly, it was Mark Pearson who was assaulted. He was assaulted by a vicious lie. He was assaulted by a police department who came and stole his freedom and peace of mind. He was assaulted by CPS and by the criminal justice system over something that there was clear evidence all the way through the whole event that he simply didn't do it. And like I said, we're going to get that, uh, we're going to get that video footage up in the low bar uh, to this interview uh, sometime today. So you guys will be able to come back and see it if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but it is, it's clear and convincing. I mean, there's just no doubt, can be no doubt in the viewer's mind that there wasn't a sexual assault that took place. It boggles my mind how this thing managed to go. Um, because, you know, when you talk about concepts like premeditation, you go through all the decisions that a person has to make to do things. And in this case, we had the police who had to actively decide after reviewing that footage and listening uh, to the uh, to the alleged victim in this case, this woman um, had to decide, well, we're going to push forth anyway. Uh, you had a, a prosecution service that had to look at all the evidence and the lack of evidence and the exculpatory evidence and say, we're going to push forward anyway. This involved a lot of premeditated abuse on the part of police and prosecutors. Um, and so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, Mr. Pearson can get legal representation. And I hope that, and I'm glad to hear that you felt like the, the conference was a supportive event for you. Um, and I, I really wish you luck in the future uh, with this, with resolving this trauma and being able to move on with your future. Uh, hopefully someday being able to, to look back on this, not as something that never happened, but as something, that, a, a big hump in your life that you got over and moved on. Um, because I can't imagine uh, what it's like being in your shoes. Uh, it would seem to me that just hearing not guilty would not be enough uh, to put closure on this. No, I, I won't get closure until I get an answer as to why it happened in the first place. That's the only thing that will finish it for me. So I have to I have to pursue a case against the, the police and the CPS. Not just for me, but for other people. This is happening to other people all the time. Um, I joined a Facebook group called Accused.me UK. And when I first joined, there were about 60 people on there, and now there are over 400. This is happening on a daily basis, people are joining this group. And this is happening... Every week, every day, people are being falsely accused. And a lot of them end up in prison. I was very lucky. I, I consider myself very fortunate that I, that I didn't go to prison. I could have so easily have gone to prison if I didn't have the, the imagery that we had. Mark, did, at any time during this process, did the idea of suicide ever run through your mind? I have to be honest, yeah. I mean, I think anyone would in that situation. I mean, you don't think straight. You, I had a terror of going to prison for a, such a vile accusation. I mean, I know what happens to sex offenders in prison. I'm not exactly a well-built guy. That would have been a nightmare for me. So you, you think about that. I mean, it was only the fact that I wouldn't want to put my partner through that and I, my friends. I think that was the only reason I didn't do that, to be honest. Well, whatever your reasons, I'm, I'm glad you didn't. Um, and uh, I want to wish you all the luck in your legal proceedings in the future. Mark, if people, uh, do you have a website uh, even for your artwork where people might contact you? Yeah, if you go to markbentonpearson.com. Can you spell that out? Pardon? Uh, well, we'll put a link in the low bar. Okay. To, to your website uh, for people to click through. One of the ways uh, that you, uh, I don't know, do you sell your art from that site? Yeah, I sell work in New York mainly. Um, okay. I have an outlet in New York. So. Well, if you're an art aficionado and you want to support Mark, uh, that might be a very good way to do it. Um, and certainly 
you know, legal cases, particularly against, you know, government agencies, police, things like that. They are expensive processes. And he's right. They're fraught with danger. It's very hard to find representation uh, because filing a lawsuit against the wrong person in government, uh, you can find yourself on the outside of all the circles very quickly. Um, it's going to take a rare and courageous attorney to take your case. Um, but I wish you luck with that. Mark, is there anything else that you want to add? Any thoughts you want to add to this before we close up? Uh, not that I can think of. <laughs> okay, well, I really appreciate you coming here and, and sitting down and talking to me and sharing this with people. Um, uh, folks, I'm going to put Mark's website. Um, would you like me to put that uh, Facebook group in the low bar too? Yeah, please, Paul. I mean, if anyone's in the same situation, please join a group like that because it's a, it's a godsend. I didn't know about it at the time. It would have really helped me. Okay, we'll get all that stuff uh, within the hour. Uh, so if you're not watching this live, if you see it down the road, by the time you see it, uh, in all likelihood, uh, all the uh, web links and everything will be in there. Um, I just want to extend to you that uh, on behalf of a voice for men and the people there that, uh, you know, whatever you do in the future to take action on this, that uh, we will throw in whatever weight we can to helping you uh, secure funding for attorneys or, or whatever it is. Um, you've got some people rooting for you. Uh, so sorry you went through this, uh, but thank you for coming here and sharing it. Uh, maybe it'll help somebody else who's going through the same thing. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Okay, with that, folks, uh, going to wish you all a good day. Um, on behalf of myself, Mark Pearson, all the people at A Voice from Men, and to uh, remind everybody that in a couple of months, tickets to ICMI 17, which is going to be in Gold Coast, Australia. We're going down under uh, to talk about men's issues and to uh, a country that is a literally a continent that's a hotbed for feminism. It's sure to be quite an interesting event, and uh, hopefully we can coax Mark, uh, coax Mark Pearson into being there for that event as well. Uh, we'd certainly love to have him with that. I want to wish everybody a good day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.